I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. And you know, it's all about the neighborhood. This is a conversation about how we build our community, our neighborhood, house by house, family by family. We're focusing on business creation, business development, economic development, and culture. Conversations with Al McFarland is brought to you by U.S. Bank. with Al McFarland and we go directly to our host. Hey Al. Thank you Wayne. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. Glad to be here and glad to have you along. In this series we've talked about entrepreneurship, about business creation, the challenges, the opportunities, what it takes, what it feels like, uh, how you have to believe uh, in yourself, your product, your idea, and in the conditions, the timing uh, to bring a product to market to prevail. We've talked to entrepreneurs who say they represent third and fourth generations of millionaires and entrepreneurs who are just starting, first time moving out of corporate or out of community into uh, business opportunities. My personal story is that uh, my family, my mother and dad owned a grocery store in Kansas City and on both sides of the family there were uh, inklings of entrepreneurship. Uh, both in the farming area from our father's family in Jamaica and Cuba and in the south sharecropper farming on our mother's side but nonetheless business well I'm pleased to have uh, one of the other members of our family here as well as my brother Wayne all of us uh, see ourselves as businessmen and businesswomen in our family my brother Micah McFarland uh, who managed uh, the ipso facto product uh, that Wayne has led has also worked as a serial entrepreneur and presently is leading a business called Revel Spirits Inc. Micah, welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. This is pretty awesome to be here <laughs> with my brothers, you know, my brother Wayne and uh, all the years that we spent on the road putting Ipso Facto together and uh, you as a mentor and having a conversation with you, this is absolutely a um, dream come true. Well, it's long overdue, Special. long overdue. Yeah. Also, Silas Houston is here. Silas Houston is the uh, CFO of Metro Area Small Contractors Alliance. And uh, we're going to talk later in the program about what that organization is, but I want you to join this conversation, Silas, in identifying and talking about the entrepreneurial spirit and the need for our community uh, to see itself as a community of entrepreneurs. That's what I think the message is today. Micah, I wanted you to tell, you, tell the, the Revel story. I have to tell you that uh, it's amazing to watch my younger brother, one of my little brothers, come forward with a global vision and a, a national, potentially global product in a space that's hot uh, nationally and internationally in the alcohol business. And so would you tell people what this business proposition is, how it came to you, and what your vision is for bringing this product to market. Yes, um, it happened in Los Angeles. That's where I'm, you know, presently living. Uh, met a guy uh, at a bar, and that's the start of it. And uh, he, I ordered a Patron margarita, and he said, "Why did you order that?" And I said, "Well, Patron's the best." He said, "No, you got to try this." So. I tried his product and I said, that was interesting. And um, he decided, you know, to strike up a friendship and was also looking for uh, a way into the entertainment business. And he came to my house to watch the Minnesota Vikings and the um, New Orleans Saints game. And then he brought over his product, but what he noticed at my house is that the people that were in my sphere, you know, they're Minnesotans but they were from the music and the entertainment and the movie business. And so he was like, 
you know, everybody is looking for that Sammy Hager um, uh, tequila story where, you know, he builds this company and he sells it for $120 million. Uh, I just thought that was fascinating. And uh, the guy said, hey, you know, would you help me out? And I went and put together a business plan for him. And as I was doing the business plan and then went down to Mexico, I identified there was a space. Uh, met another guy named Hector Ruiz and found out that in this little town called Morelos, Mexico, they were making this great agave spirits and they had no way of selling it to the mass market. So I uh, went to a few friends and said, hey, would you get involved with this? And they said, oh yeah, sure. And, uh, and uh, but if you owned this, we would get behind you. And that's when the light bulb came off. And I said, okay. And then I had a business partner named Jackie Thompson and uh, another one named Susan. And I said, you know, Susie, I went and got some seed money from her and Jackie helped me put the, the business plan together. And then we started raising money. And then we started creating this product. And now we have virtually put a pipeline together with the farmers and distillers of Morelos, Mexico, along with the governor of Morelos, Mexico, and you know, to be able to import into the United States, and, and we signed on with the largest distributor in the US called Southern uh, Glacier Wine and Spirits, along with Johnson Brothers that was here. What we've done now is created our own uh, category of the agave spirit. So mm -hmm. let, let's, let's do agave okay. 101. Okay, because, agave you know, 101. When people see this, they first of all think about tequila. Yes. And there's some reasons you don't call this tequila. It's not tequila. It's, it's, okay. it's Avila. Yes. But Avila is never heard of before, right? Absolutely. You created it. Yep. So give people a primer of how you approach identifying, naming, and bringing a concept and actually a category that didn't exist before to market. But what's right. the background, the backstory? So the background of that story is that there's life beyond tequila. This is, tequila is the alpha dog of the agave spirits. Everybody knows it. They had their high school Cuervo story or their Patron story. Those are the biggest tequilas in, in, in the world. Okay. With what and everybody's tequila finding, means it's made in a certain place though, right? Tequila like, has like to be, champagne. Yep. Yeah, tequila has to be three things. It has to be made out of the Blue Weber agave plant. Okay. It, the product, the liquid that comes in it, it has to be at least 51% of that, of that juice that's from that plant and also has to be uh, from geographically five, five states in the Mexico, starting with Jalisco is the biggest one. Mm -hmm. And then there's four other states. And if it's not from those regions and those states, and it doesn't have Blue Weber agave in it, it cannot be called tequila. Right. Then there's another product called Mezcal, which is really the overarching of all of it. And mezcal comes from these states called Oaxaca, Guerrero, and Puebla in Mexico. And is also made out of a different plant, a different species called the espadín. Okay, and then from there, there is in Sonora, Mexico, there's another absolutely gorgeous plant called Bacanara. And, it, and from there, they make a product that's called Bacanara and it's from the Sonora, Mexico. Uh, and then there's another flower plant called Sotol, which is from Chihuahua, Mexico, the northern part of Mexico. So these are what they call the agave spirits of Mexico. Morelos, my state, these guys were making uh, products with the Blue Weber, the Espadine, and another one called August Folio How, which is a native plant to Morelos. The place has an active volcano, so the soil is higher in nutrients from the alkaline, and they have really beautiful aquifers underneath that, you know, running there with really fresh water. So with that, these farmers were making and growing this product, but really didn't have the infrastructure to sell it and know how to bring it, into, bring it to market. And, uh, I went to one of my friends and uh, said, hey, you know, I need $2 million. And he, I gave him my business plan and 
He was like, okay, Mike, you know, I read your business plan. I kind of like it. Two million, that's a lot of money. And I said, oh, well, that's what it's going to take. And he said, so how are you going to market and sell a tequila that you can't call tequila? And I was like, okay. And he stood up, <laughs> walked me out the door. You know, that was the end of my, you know, my pitch. It was over at that time. And I sat in my car, you know, almost crying going, okay, I just raised $600,000 from friends and family, and I don't know how I'm going to sell this. That's where I was at at this moment. And uh, so then I went back down to Mexico, and I was sitting there, Hector and uh, Noe, his last, last name is Avila. And I said, Noe, how do you say your last name? He says, Avila. I said, Avila? He said, Avila. I said, Avila? Avila. <laughs> Avila? And then, bam. It hit me, you know, and uh, I called Jackie, my partner. I said, look, marketing 101, die by the sword. From this point on, any agave spirit coming out of the Morello state of Mexico is called Avila. She said, okay, okay, okay. I got it, got it. Came back, and that's what we said. And then we went out and got all the trademarks and all this other stuff. You made it formal. You made we it made it formal. You created a yeah. category in the state has authorized and sanctioned. Right. So now the, the product that comes from anybody is going to be called? Avila. Avila. From the state of Morelos. Great story. Yeah. Great story. So, We're super so what, excited. What, what's it take? What's it take to um, stay focused? Uh, it's difficult. Business is difficult. Uh, I, yeah. I think business is difficult, but I think that you generally have to have the passion, you know, the passion and the belief in your product. I remember when my brothers and I, we started Ipso Facto, knew nothing about the music business. I was just all about that kid that, one, worshiped my brother. The other, you know, I love music, you know, and I was passionate about it. I was one of those kids that read the backs of all these records, you know, and kind of knew, oh, Keith Jarrett played on this one and that one and that one, you know, connecting the dots. So I think, you know, you just have to have a singular focus at that time. You know, you got to put the blinders on and you can't let left and right get in your way. You just have to like go. And then the other thing is like, there's not a word called no. You just, it's like, okay, not yet. <laughs> yeah, it's simple as that. And as long as you, and if you can singularly focus on that, you will get there. And I also believe it's sustaining and maintaining and just don't stop. Don't give up. Let everybody tell your ideas are crazy. Just don't stop. And, uh, and I don't know any other way to be. What's the grand vision? You've, so now from that, you've come up with a, a product that you've brought to market. A um, lot of elements from you know, uh, uh, bringing this to the consumer. What do you see in five years or 10 years? Where do you want this business to go? Well, what I see is, you know, it wasn't the mission in the beginning. It was like just getting it to market. But as we have evolved and, and every time we're sending money to Mexico, we're seeing, you know, the roads change. And we are seeing all these things that are happening because of our dollars going into it. And you're actually seeing the buildings change because you've put that money there, you know. And so the thing is, is to be able to uh, sustain the farmer, and distiller, uh, and the you know job creation, um, and in five years, I'd love to see uh, this doing really well and just putting really a lot of money back into the communities. Not only the community in Mexico, but my own community here and and my family. Okay, great, great. Yeah. Silas, how do you interpret that story as uh, how common how? Uh, consistent it is with the motivation people bring to starting and launching and uh, pursuing business strategies? Um, I, th I think it's certainly um, you have to have a passion, you have to have that drive. Um, he described also a, a team, um, you know, and, and a support system um, and 
that he had done a number of things over the years that caused people to have confidence in him, which allowed them to be willing to invest in him. And I think that that's really um, at the core of what has to match that passion and that drive. You have to have those other things to go along with it. Yeah, absolutely. So like I said, my middle name is, you know, Micah Dylan for Dollars McFarland, you know, so <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that's part of it. We got a couple of minutes left, Micah, but you know, we all talk about you all the time for the traveling you've done around the world. Yes. And just give a minute, uh, just sort of uh, your work in the music business, um, managing bands, uh, it kind of puts you in position to know people. Right. And what I understand is that the knowledge you've acquired, the contacts you've made over years, now give you a Rolodex. And yes. that's where the dialing for dollars takes place. Right. Well, that's what I would say to any young entrepreneur or any young person is, being able to take your contacts and keep filing them, filing them, filing them, filing them, so that you have this so-called Rolodex. And you don't even know why you're, why you're collecting it, but someday along the line, it will happen. And believe me, I have 4,500 names in my Rolodex, per se, or my database, and I know every single one of them. And every week, regardless and religiously, I'll take three hours out and go in the A's or the B's and C's and go either send an email or go, hey, how you doing? This is Micah. Oh, man, how you been? You know, and being able to use that to cultivate business you know, and, and just keeping in touch. It's about relationships. Now, at, with, the, with, with Ipso Facto, I was able, after we decided not to really be a, a, a touring band as much, I went on and worked with uh, Cindy Lauper, uh, Blondie, Dwight Yoakam, uh, Lifehouse, Lifehouse <laughs> Michelle Branch, and then to this day I still handle one person. You know, because I we made a deal. That I said I, you know, no matter what I'm doing, I will handle you until you are done. And that's uh, the iconic Bob Newhart. So. I, uh, I'm one of his managers and proud to be one of his managers. And, but with that, it also gave me contacts to all these different people. Every, everyone opened up doors, and it's about your personality and being able to uh, take that and then leverage it. Micah, thank you. We're out of time, but all right. great I to could have talk this, forever. <laughs> great to have this. Well, it runs in the family, I think. <laughs> great right, to have this you. conversation. I'm Al McFarland. So this is Conversations with Al McFarland. When we come back, we'll talk more to Silas Houston about this notion of entrepreneurship and how sometimes collaborations create opportunity. Stay tuned. Conversations with Al McFarland is brought to you by U.S. Bank. Welcome back to Conversations with Al McFarland. I continue my discussion with Silas Houston, CFO of Metro Area Small Contractors Alliance. They call it MASCA. It's a minority-owned and operated for-profit LLC uh, uh, corporation. And the mission of MASCA is to support and to create businesses uh, that do well in construction. Is that correct, Silas? It is, most definitely. It's uh, development and growth, job creation, um, poverty reduction. It's a business development model is what we, it's, that's how we view it. Okay, so what kinds of businesses are you doing and how do you interact with uh, the uh, alliance members, contractors? Well, you know, when we say alliance, we have a broad view of the word alliance. And so certainly between the contractors, we look for uh, bring contractors together and have them share resources, work together in partnership, 
in pursuing projects and pursuing opportunities. When we think of alignment, we also think of the nonprofit community, those that are there to support the business development. We also think of the uh, training facilities, you know, summit, places like that, that are creating, you know, interested workers to come into the field. Uh, we think it includes, you know, the estimators. I think it includes the nonprofit developers who have, you know, projects that they need to have done. I think it includes the city, the county, the state. Um, we really believe that by working in alignment, we can create an ecosystem where rapid development of minority companies can take place. We think that that has to happen. Um, and that comes along with the need for an increased amount of investment in minority companies. So how do you well. do that? How do you move towards that? And, and give me an idea of, of when you had the idea uh, to bring this coalition or alliance or alignment into being, uh, what was your vision? What was your hope and intent? And how have you progressed uh, along that path? Well, you know, we started off with, um, it was a research project to start off with. The city of St. Paul got hit with their VCA, Voluntary Compliance Agreement, was not involuntary. HUD came in and found that they were out of compliance with even reporting, let alone meeting the goals of inclusion for Section 3, low in, which is low income, from MBE, WBE businesses. And so when HUD then came in and said, you must do better, we saw that meaning that the environment was going to change. So we started doing some research. And what we found in our research is, is that um, there's a number of small minority contractors that are out there. Many of them are run, you know, a single guy, partner, mom and pop, and that they were trying to compete with companies that could had... Could be a tradesman, could tradesman, be a plumber. Could be a plumber. Uh, Most of them, that's what it started off at. Yeah. They were, you know, they worked in the trades and then they sprouted off and started their company. And there's a whole backstory to that mm -hmm. of not being treated right, you know, by the union, not given an equal hours, which spurred them to leave and go and start their own businesses, mm -hmm. which then put them in a position where they're back trying to compete with that person I used to work with, but I don't have the same right. managerial support system that they have. I don't have the same capitalization that they have. But I'm here and I'm doing it and it's better than not having a job and it's better than the way that they were treating me, which is what we found when we talked to a lot of these people. So our thing came from where are we at now and then how do we move forward from there. Mm -hmm. We couldn't wish ourselves to a better place, which would be nice, but so we're at a position where there's a need for some baseline day-to-day -day support, somebody to pay the bills, to do the accounting, to do the bookkeeping. That's just so we can get enough confidence so that some real investment in them can begin to take place. In construction in particular, investment is such a huge thing. The size of project, how much work you can do, what you, how much, what you can bid, pursue, how much bonding you can get is all predicated on how much capitalization that you have. And without it, even if somebody wants to hire you, you're just limited in how much work that you're able to do. You can't handle the work without you just, capitalization. You can't, you can't handle the work. And so mm -hmm. our model says, instead of attempting to do it alone, we come at it together. We find you know, businesses that work well together, have them pursue projects together, have them pursue capitalization together. We put them in partnerships with general contractors that's willing to give them ongoing work. One of the things that we found with our research is, is that any attempt to solve a problem that is called disadvantaged businesses and then ask that business to be the low bidder, to be the cheapest. If they could be that, they're not disadvantaged. You could be the low bidder and grow your businesses and make a profit. In no way are you disadvantaged. And so the model of attempting to have them be the low bidder while they're trying to recoup from this disadvantaged status is just one that we don't see it's not tenable. So we really need to get them into more negotiated work, cost plus relationships. And that comes from having a relationship with a general contractor who has a relationship with a developer who understands that reality. We're not talking about breaking the bank where you become overly expensive, but we are talking about where you have to recognize that the workman's comp costs for a small contractor is much higher than his bigger competitor, his unemployment costs. This is per dollar of labor. They're paying, you know, sometimes two, three times the amount. You know, they're paying 10, 12 percent while somebody else is paying 4 percent. And, no, and those costs have to be covered at the time when I'm paying this person and the payroll is done. And so 
we break it down to when you want to support a small contract, instead of thinking of small, supporting that business, you need to think of supporting that worker that you want to see them put to work. And for a non-union contractor, it costs them about $15,000 in how much money I got to pay out before I get paid back when I have someone work. About eight weeks of time that I have to pay this person before I'm going to bill that work and get it paid back. And so if I have 15 workers, or I have 20 workers, and you go to an agency and they say the max we'll loan you is $75,000, well, I can't get very far in the construction world when I have that kind of load per worker and I have a project that needs 10 people and I can get $50,000. And so they're looking at the company, they're looking at the history of it, how much they borrowed before, and they're saying 50000 Well, but you're not looking at the business, you're not looking at the opportunity, you're not looking at the growth factor, you're not looking at the job creation. And so... Um, so does everybody in the alliance benefit, or do you have groups of people that coalesce around a specific project, and that project then operates as an entity or under the umbrella of MASCA or as an MASCA project. How does it work? So well, you know, where, where, where we're at, you know, we, we've been learning and evolving as we go along. The main thing is, is one of getting that back, getting that day-to-day -day support and figuring out how to be able to share that support in a way that makes sense. And so pursuing projects together, working on the same project allows that to happen. What we really are looking at now is potentially creating a general contractor mm -hmm. that's specifically designed to be the partner to these contractors and pursue work as a collective. Um, it gives us more control over the project, but it also gives, falls into a realm of investment models that people are, are used to um, and, and being able to build enough confidence in a entity mm -hmm. that drives investment for the rest of the group so we can have job creation. Have you got projects that you can name and share uh, that uh, demonstrate how the model works? You know, we, we, we have a really great relationship with Benson Orth, which is a local general contractor here in town. They've been fantastic. We did a project with Pillsbury United that did the North Market over in, in North Minneapolis on Humboldt Avenue. Mm -hmm. We had several contractors that worked on that project. And for us, that's the perfect example so of what we're did, talking about. So how did it work? So Benson... Orth won the bid to build the project. Vincent, so Pillsbury had a project that they put out there. Vincent Orth had partnered with us. When they went for the project, we went there with them. We was part of the interview when they interviewed for the project. Mm -hmm. Our contractors were identified knowing that they were going to participate on the project. And you brought to them X number of contractors, right? Different people, we different them, right, tradesmen them, or craftsmen. Different or tra you know, tradesmen and different trades that uh, perform work on the project. Pillsbury, being a community, you know, um, nonprofit, uh, was in, in that fit their mission and what they were doing, mm -hmm. right, and what Benson Orris is looking to do long term. So we see that being that alignment. So the alignment starts with the owner who has that attitude mm -hmm. of it matters whether community people work on my project or not. Mm -hmm. And I am willing to have some sort of a cost consideration to make that happen. It, it might can't, not be the cheapest. It might not be the cheapest, right? And I, and, I, and I recognize that. And then I need a general contractor that says, okay, I accept that and I want to do that on an ongoing basis, not on a one-time basis because I have a project with goals, but I'll work with you on all of our projects, which is what Benson North does. And then we need a group of contractors that say, you know what, we feel like we work better working together than mm -hmm. we are separate. Mm -hmm. And then we need a really an investment community that says, you know what, I like that and I will invest in that. And if you then go to Summit and hire people and you go to Goodwill Easter Seal and you go to your JAMA place and you go to these different places and you not just hire someone mm -hmm. but create a career and, and then allow that person to move along a development path that goes all the way to ownership for themselves mm -hmm. at some point. But that's where the reduction of poverty comes from, that's where the transference of skills, that's where you get someone who now not, didn't just get a job but he became a journeyman and now he has transferable skills, he can move around, he can do whatever, but he no longer is limited in how much earnings they can make. If we want to see some of these disparities that we see take place, there's a direct connection between business startup, business development, 
job creation and poverty. And so we need to create more business so we can hire ourselves, so we can train ourselves, so we can develop ourselves. Um, and then we can start seeing some of these disparities go down. But I have to say that when I was listening to your brother, one of the things that he talked about was the confidence that the people had in him. And they said, if you do it, we'll put our money down. That's a critical piece. You have to have confidence enough for people to invest in your model. Mm -hmm. And when we look at ourselves as a group of people, we have a low amount of investment in ourselves. We have folks who have retirement accounts, 401ks, all these things. That money is sent away, put in somebody's hand, and they're investing it somewhere into development of some business, but it's not in our community, and it's not our businesses, and it's not. And, and so to ask us to get Facebook-like results with no investment is really not, even, even the best of ideas, um, is not going to go far. You got a marginal idea, but super investment, you're better off than with the greatest idea in no marginal investment. In, in investment. And in, so why is it, number one, and then how do you address it? I think that's a great point. I mean, it's a, that's the tipping point. Uh, I think you described it succinctly. Great idea and no money. So what? Uh, even a crappy idea, but money, yeah. uh, you can sell it, you right? Can, you can make you can it make, work. And you can make it work. Yeah. And so why is it in our community that we have this dilemma of always being on the uh, no access to capital, even capital that is originating in our community, we don't have full access to? Part of that is social, part of it is historical, uh, legacy, uh, fears, yeah. uh, but part of it is structural as well. But let me ask you, how does it look to you, and how are you addressing that? Is part of this a need to educate? I, I think most definitely a part of this is, is a need to educate. Um, when you look at the average household and, where, and what kind of this business discussion that takes place in it within our community, um, in a lot of them, there's not happening at all. There's no discussion about business taking place. And then when there are, when there are uh, discussions about business taking place, it is this far-fetched idea of, you know, big, you know, someone comes up with a great idea and overnight there's success and no real grounding and understanding how much effort and concentration it takes. But also that investment with no risk doesn't exist. And so um, if we are risky, then we have to be the one ready to take the risk on us if we, are, if we are risky. If we are not ready, we are the ones who have to invest in us getting ready. Um, but when we look at the way some of these other communities do business and the way that they finance themselves, I mean, I, my, my professional life, I work as a senior financial analyst, and I go in and I help put people put together deals, and I have never put together a deal for a even medium-sized business for somebody that wasn't black where they were forecasting to make a profit in less than three years' period of time. And so, so that means somebody's going to fund those losses. Somebody's going to look at that and say, in order for you to get this market share, we're willing to not just set the business up, but fund these losses over this period of time so you can secure this market share. Then you get a African-American entrepreneur coming to the table, mentally fi fixed on, if I don't make a profit in year one, nobody's going to loan me a red cent. And so now I try to formulate a way to penetrate a market in record time with minimum capital. It's not going to happen. It, it's, it's not going to happen. And, and so we really have to then say, why are we trying to force ourselves to do business different than other people? We should be able to set up our business, put our business models together, and then go to the community, the place that's holding our money, mm -hmm. waiting for us to show up with an idea that works for us. But if we're continuously, we look at this as a competition because they give you all these ratios and all these comparisons of numbers, and it gives a, it gives a competitive view of, okay, if they are doing great and we're not doing great, how did they get there? And how do we fix it? Mm -hmm. 
And if our resources are going to help support them to grow their businesses and it's not there to help us, that's a comment really easy to understand as to mm -hmm. why mm -hmm. they're doing better than we are. Mm -hmm. And then if you get to the actual retail trade side of things, if we're going in buying stuff that they make and they're not buying anything that we make, that's a transference of wealth that happens every single day. And if we don't address those things, then we will never have the resources to fix our problem because it's constantly going to someone else. So we have to have enough confidence in ourselves to withdraw the dollars from investing it elsewhere and invest it with ourselves. But don't change the rules. Don't come to me and say, okay, when I invest in my 401k, I'm willing to wait 20 years when I give it to them, but if I give it to you, I want it back in five years. That just doesn't align and allow us to really be competitive when it comes to true business growth and, and development. So why are we so confident in them, but not in ourselves? Um, I, I think Whoever that, the them may be. I mean, I, mean, I, 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 think, I think it's a visual thing. I think that when we, I mean, until recently, you know, the thought of who would lead this country was the one color, right? And so and then, we had, and then we see the backlash that comes from that. So I think that there's a certain amount of cultural conditioning that has taken place over a long period of time that there is racial discrimination that takes place. There is those, you know, um, barriers that are put there, designed so that I know you can't meet those things. And that's why at the core of it, it comes down to us having to withdraw our dollars and make our own rules. Otherwise, those historical barriers and in, in the routes of getting to the dollars continues to flow through them. And, and then it makes it difficult for us to meet that comparison. Um, but I do believe that there's people, you know, there's people doing crowdfunding, there's people doing all sorts, and that is nice, and I think that that is certainly methods that we should look at, but at the core of it, we really got to say that if there's a certain portion of us that are doing okay, getting a check on a regular basis, and building for their future, can you really build for your future when all of the resources end up supporting somebody else's future? Uh, where does that leave you? I mean, and so I think that we have to deal with that on a very systemic level, on a personal level of, you know, you watched the movie Black Panther and you saw that whole thing of belief in oneself because the whole concept was that we never lost it. So mm -hmm. it just built from there. And so we have to come back to that and say, you know, do I believe in our own ingenuity? Do I believe in what we could put together? If we had, the, if we had all the resources, do I believe in what? And, and if the answer is no, um, then we got some serious problems. I say if the answer is no, then you got to pretend like it's yes, even if it is no, mm -hmm. because no can't be the answer. It can't be I'm not going to invest in myself, mm -hmm. but I'm going to continue to invest in others. That can, they, we can't expect to get good do, results do we if we keep doing that. we understand that we're investing in others and not investing in ourselves? Do we have, even, do we have that, um, uh, are we articulating that in a way that we understand the consequence of the decisions we make as consumers? What do you think? I, or is it, <laughs> is it part of the, the background, you know. I, I, I do think that we need to be more purposeful in, in talking about, you know, all the different ways that we invest in others, which in result marginalize us. I think that we have to, you know, bring that to the forefront. Um, I think we have to begin to create mechanisms for us to make that switch. You know, it's one thing to say, but it's got to be a, you know, because there's all of these barriers to entry that takes place. They call them protections, but they work the same way in terms of, right, you can't come on, you, you have to have a certain license, you have to have a certain certification before mm -hmm. you can even talk to somebody right. about making a direct investment in something. And if you're going to house the money, you got to meet a certain amount of fiduciary responsibility and all of these mm -hmm. things. And so the first level investment we got to make is in creating those entities so that we can begin to receive those dollars. But um, if we don't have a pathway that is of our making, that is our commitment to, that we're ready to take the risk on, then we can't be surprised that others aren't willing to do it. And so I, 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 I think we have to talk about it. I think we have to get, have forms around. I think we have to begin to teach people how, 
um, and what kind of risk they're currently taking and compared to what kind of risk it would be. When you spend your dollar, what should you expect back from it? When other communities spend their dollar, they not only expect to get the product, they expect to get a job in the store, they expect to get a job at the distribution house that supplies the store, they get the right at the manufacturer. And, and, and when those things don't happen, the retailer responds to it because he knows what his customer wants. We demand very little for our dollar, and we have to demand more, and we have to trust ourselves to give ourselves more. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's tough to blame someone else when you continue to give them your resources and say, I'll give it to you so you can help me back when I can keep it myself and, and, um, and develop my own. Silas, thank you so much. Thank you. Good talking to yes. you. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. Uh, a great conversation. Silas Houston is the CFO of Metro Area Small Contractors Alliance. They call it MASCA. We'll talk more about business and economic development. Conversations with Al McFarland is brought to you by U.S. Bank. McFarland, welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. And uh, today's a special program. We're taping an interview with Governor Mark Dayton, uh, Minnesota Governor. Governor, thank you for sitting down with us today. And with uh, James Burroughs, you're the Chief of Diversity and Inclusion, I believe, yes. for the state of Minnesota. Thank you for taking this time. Good to be with you're welcome. Yeah, no. Governor, uh, jump right into it. What do diversity and inclusion mean to you? Uh, why have you sort of taken the strong stands you've taken to move our state uh, in a different direction? Well, Minnesota's changed uh, in complexion uh, from when I was growing up. And uh, we, in state government, we were not, not keeping pace with that, uh, uh, you know, 20% of our population will be men and women of color within just a couple of years. And uh, state government employment, state government contracting was really languishing behind. And we recognize not only do if, even if we had the good intentions of wanting to diversify and expand those uh, relationships, we didn't have the connections uh, with your, your constituents and the people, your readers and mm -hmm. with others in the minority community. So uh, you know, James is a huge addition to our office and to our administration in, in establishing those connections, making that outreach, and it's made a real difference in terms of state employment has gone from 8% men and women of color to 12% just mm -hmm. to, since he t took over there and we have a lot more to do but we're making some progress. You're doing significant work in identifying and promoting women in general with women of color in particular. Talk about some of the women that you've moved forward in their career path in state government. Well I mean, men are very talented too but women have uh, special <laughs> talents and they often don't have the opportunities in the private sector. So you get uh, t very talented women who uh, see an opportunity to be a commissioner or to be a, a leader in a, a high level. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's often an opportunity they haven't uh, been able to obtain in the private sector. Now, I think that's improving, but it's still the case. And, and again, the, the key is that you know, James and others who worked with him have been reaching out, say, hey, can you consider uh, this position in state government? We have this, we're looking for people. Same thing with the judiciary. I feel really good mm -hmm. about having uh, increased significantly the diversity of people in, in the judiciary in Hennepin County, Ramsey County District Courts. As somebody said, when you, when you walk into a courtroom and you don't see anybody that looks like you, you're not going to believe you're going to have a chance to get a fair, fair deal. To me, that speaks to the question of systemic change. Uh, one thing that Minnesota has been known for is its ability to be silent to be quiet uh, when uh, a loud voice was really the appropriate thing. You have been a loud voice, but talk about the general cultural environment uh, that you've had to work with and how you think you've moved it. Well, I, I think it is a challenging area for Minnesotans. And uh, again, most of us my age and like grew up in a basically all white Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, we don't have that, we don't have those relationships. We don't have the experience. Uh, you know, commu 
communicating uh, across uh, those spectrums. We have, of course, new populations, Hmong, Somali, which have their own uh, cultures that are you know, different from even American-born African-Americans, mm -hmm. for example. So it's, it's, uh, it takes a real intentional effort, and it takes people to help make those connections, uh, which we can't do on our own. That's where, mm -hmm. turn, turn, turn over you, James, that's where you've been so important. What are the numbers, James? You've got some sure. great findings or great reports mm -hmm. uh, that say you have moved the needle in terms of inclusion. Uh, Huge percentages. Talk about that if you would. So yeah, so we, I think we moved the needle collectively. Um, uh, the governor brought me on the chief inclusion officer role to kind of help synergize people in different communities along with state government. So we moved it in the last uh, two years I've been there. We were at about, as the governor said, in 2011, eight percent people of color. When I got into the office, about nine point eight percent. We've up to twelve point three percent now. Employment. Um, employment in, in the government. last two years. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also employed a lot of people in leadership roles. So. Uh, we have about 8% of those folks in leadership roles in the government, our top 1,000 employees, mm -hmm. are people of color now as well. Uh, we've increased in people with disabilities too. Uh, we've gone from 4.3% in 2011 to 6.9% now, and we're headed to a goal of 10%. Of we've increased that goal by the end of uh, the governor's term. Uh, and we've done it by just getting out to talking to people. And one of the things we do is we work with the People of Color Career Fair the last uh, two years. And we've done it a different way out. We've brought out like 60 of our employees to come out and just have it like a fair or I'll say like even an employment party, get a chance to know people, build relationships. And then from that, those fairs, we brought in like 12 to 15 people in leadership roles. So it's been very successful over the last few years. Minnesota's a big business. It's a big company. Uh, it's a multi-billion dollar company. The question has always been how much of its spending is uh, directed to and through uh, people of color. And you've addressed that as well. What are the numbers? So the numbers now are much better than they were, but we're not where we need to be. So um, in 2015, example, in the African-American community, we spent out of our $2 billion, we spent 135000 with black-owned businesses. So that's $2 billion, 135000 By comparison, in that same period of time, you spent uh, 11 million with Asian-owned businesses. Mm -hmm. You spent uh, about 1.1 uh, 1 .1 million with Hispanic Latino businesses, only 73,000 with indigenous. Uh, to your credit, 25 million to women-owned businesses, only 1.8 million uh, with veteran businesses. But you know the glaring number mm -hmm. is the one you stated first: right. only 135,000 right. dollars with businesses owned by African Americans. Yeah. Why did that happen, number one? Oh. And you've done some great things. Tell me what you've done about it, yeah. So why did it happen? Um, I can't really speak to I wasn't here, but I'll say this. What we've done is more intentionality about going to the communities, saying these are the ways in which you can partner with state government. Uh, for example, there's a company here, Thor Companies, Thor Industries, Thor mm -hmm. Construction, um, multi-million dollar construction company, I think third nationally as far as black owned businesses. They started here uh, in Minnesota. They hadn't done much work with the state. So we needed time to redo the Senate office building a couple years ago. We reached out in a strategic way to say, hey, we want a targeted business. So we had Thor compete against other targeted businesses, hired them for a $1.3 million contract. Great. So intentionality. The other thing is we went out to the community, worked with the African American Leadership Forum. We've worked with the Latino Lead and saying, where are these businesses we need to work with? So the number you gave, I gave you the 135,000, mm -hmm. is now for the half year of this fiscal year, we're at about 1.5 million. So it's like a thousand percent increase from where it was, mm -hmm. and we're headed in the right direction to do more. We're going to do more targeted business, what's called sheltered markets, mm -hmm. where we're allowed to just have targeted businesses compete against each other. And two, Al, we have a special thing called Equity Select that the legislature passed that you can hire a minority or women-owned or targeted business for a contract $25,000 or less without a bid process. So if you came to me and said you want to do some communication strategy and it's less than 25, I could identify you because you're a targeted business and, and work with you as well. So those numbers are much higher. And the indigenous populations too, that number half a year is about 400,000 now compared to the 73,000 mm -hmm. for the whole year. So we're mm -hmm. doing a lot better we have a lot more to do in that particular space, but I think now the community has built a trust with us, with the governor, with myself, and others to say, you really want to do this and you're making efforts to do it, so I think those things are paying off. Governor, what's the end game in this area? What is your vision? What would you like to see uh, as the description of how we do business in Minnesota 
if this was the best Minnesota well, it uh, could be? I think, How would it look? I think uh, within state government, uh, the people are 33,200 people should be representative of the uh, population, uh, which again is uh, going to be close to 20% very soon. Mm -hmm. Uh, contracting, uh, as James says, we started uh, disgracefully low, mm -hmm. and so we've made, in percent, you know, really excellent progress. And and uh, you know, James has been key to that. But it's still, even uh, women-owned businesses, 25 million out of two billion, still just a tiny fraction. So we just we need to be more aggressive, more intentional. We need to uh, hold agencies uh, to account for the contracting decisions they've made. Mm -hmm. And put it on their responsibility to go out and and uh, seek out these uh, contracting opportunities. You know, I think the, the in addition to the Senate office building, the uh, U.S. Bank Stadium was a great example. I mean, you set a target there of 35 percent mm -hmm. uh, minority employment, and you'll say, well, that's uh, you know unreachable. It's 30, hit 39 percent, mm -hmm. and and involved a lot of uh, uh, minority businesses as well. So. You know, if you put your mind to it and your intentions to it, and and then also measure your progress so that people know that you can hold them to account for what they have or have not achieved, uh, then you can build in that systemic, uh, you know, commitment. And then it's a matter of continuing to build upon it. Where is the resistance? Uh, why hasn't it been so? And what makes Mark Dayton so committed? to uh, demonstrating that it can be done? Well, I, I can't speak to what would preceded me either, mm -hmm. although, you know, when we started, uh, you know, had a genuine good intention, but good intention was not enough because, again, we didn't know how to carry it out. We didn't have the relationships with the communities, and that's why, you know, bringing James on. I believe the first chief inclusion officer in the state, any state in the country. That's Correct. We, we the that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, that we just realized that we didn't have the wherewithal mm -hmm. to make the connections to carry out our, our, our ambitions. So, you know, that was crucial, crucial and then, you know, to learn how to go about it. But uh, we also, you know, we just had a meeting of the top senior leadership in the administration mm -hmm. of all the agencies, and James, uh, you know, led that session and, you know, I've made that a, a priority with the cabinet members. I mean, you have to tell people who haven't paid attention to this before, or have mm -hmm. a lot of other things they pay attention to, hey, sure. this has got to be n number one, number two mm -hmm. uh, at the top here, and, and then reinforce that, and then again measure mm -hmm. um, who's making progress and who's not. And so, I mean, we really, my goal is to build this in to the institutions of state government so that when I leave in 10 months, we're going to have this uh, ongoing, no matter who my successor is. Mm -hmm. So, as you approach your departure from uh, this office as governor of Minnesota, uh, what do you see as your legacy? Uh, I'm going to throw out uh, education. Uh, I know you as an observer and as a reporter, as a person who's made strong statements promoting pre-K and K through 12 and education opportunity throughout the life cycle. I know that you have championed creating uh, licensure pathways to get more people of color into the profession of teaching. But what, what are you thinking uh, in terms of the Mark Dayton legacy? What do you want to be remembered well, like for? Well, legacies are for other people and for obituaries. Uh, uh, okay. You know, I, I got three months now of a legislative session. That's my focus. Uh, uh, we have some really important uh, issues uh, to deal with. What are your top issues uh, right now for the session coming up? What are they? Well, the federal tax bill has major implications is going to raise a lot of working Minnesotans' taxes and lower mm -hmm. some others. Mm -hmm. So we've got to fine-tune that if we're going to adopt the federal uh, conformity, which simplifies tax returns. Mm -hmm. it's got, we've got to hold people harmless from the you know, 500 to $5,000 tax increases. Mm -hmm. And uh, the bonding bill, especially focused on higher education, uh, we, we need to base basic repairs for our, our higher education uh, colleges, universities, mm -hmm. University of Minnesota, Minnesota State. I like it. We have enough budget uh, surplus in the next forecast to continue to put more money into early educate early childhood education. I think that's one of the best ways we have to try to close the achievement gap or pre prevent it from starting or, or growing. Um, but we'll have to see what's possible with this. Uh, legislature and I don't exactly see eye to eye and 
Mm-hmm. You know, we're not starting out on the best of terms after I took them to court. So they took me to court. <laughs> right. Yeah, and, uh, and, and I prevailed. So we'll see what we'll have to see in this election year. We'll have to see what's possible. What do you and, see? And I would say also, you know, thank again with James leadership and others too, and and uh, Senator Champion and, mm-hmm. and others in the legislature. You know, we really pushed for additional funds uh, to help uh, build that uh, you know, employment I, I, capacity mm-hmm. within uh, the you know communities of color in the state. We need to build on that too. We got part of the funding, but not uh, all of it. And then we should come back and. That was the equity package. They called it right. That was uh, part yes, of you called right. that. Yep. What, what was the concept of that? Well, that we just again we we hadn't put our money where we said our our beliefs are, mm-hmm. and that we hadn't you know in provided the resources for those out there that have that capability and are doing it to, to expand uh, their reach mm-hmm. and, and bring more people, whether it's into employment training and it's like, you know, some of the academies, some things like that, and others uh, that are, you know, really out there in the real world making those connections, transforming lives, saving lives. Uh, but, you know, the amount of money you have to put into those efforts is uh, partly defines your, your capacity, and we mm-hmm. want you to build those capacities uh, in, in our communities of color. And say, okay, well, listen, I thank you. I think this is about it. Uh, l- one last question. With the political season coming up, uh, we had a lot of more people uh, moving into politics uh, in St. Paul, the mayor, Melvin Carter, in Minneapolis, uh, several city council seats, park board seats. So a lot of new sort of inclusion energy coming up from neighborhoods. What do you see? Uh, because there's a sort of a big pushback from the federal Republican level. But how do you see our society moving forward in the political arena? That's the general question. And a specific one is about women and politics. In Alabama last year, uh, black women voted at the polls to uh, keep Roy Moore out of uh, the Senate uh, because of his sexual, alleged sexual misconduct. And since then, there's been a push to elect black women into office, uh, how can state government uh, and progressive people sort of continue, expand that intentionality so that the umbrella, the tent uh, grows and more people get a chance to serve our country, uh, our future? What do you think? Well, there are, there are d- legislative districts in especially Minneapolis and St. Paul, which are uh, you know, predominantly men and women of color, mm-hmm. uh, led by very good uh, white Men and women mm-hmm. who've been many of them in the legislature for a, a long time, and uh, like me, uh, they need to recognize that one of the ways they can, you know, bring the future uh, to the forefront is by stepping aside mm-hmm. and opening up a seat that's almost certainly going to be Democrat and, and very likely a person of color. Has happened with uh, Ileana Omar, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, unfortunately, she had to go to a primary to, to effectuate that. But you've got uh, Karen Clark. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you've got uh, Paul Thiessen mm-hmm. and a couple others uh, I would encourage to you know, follow suit. Uh, they've done a good job, but uh, you know, their, their time is, the time has come for the next generation of leadership and, and particularly men and women, women of color who better represent those, those uh, communities that they're serving. Final, any advice to our communities? How can we uh, even be more aggressive in moving the ball? And you know, just be politically engaged and, and build your, your, your team of, of leaders. But you know, citizen engagement is the, the name of it. That's what moves legislators. That's what moves legislation. And you know, if, people, if good people stand on the sidelines, then the people with lesser motives uh, mm-hmm. run, uh, run the show. So we need more and more good people, young people. You know, I love meeting with uh, young people. You know, I I left an elementary school and I was in the Senate. I said, you know, to my staff person, we could just lower the voting age to five. I might win another election. Right. And she looked at me and she said, it would be close. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, you look at the complexion of again of our uh, schools. Yeah. And we just That's need to get those young people uh, knowing that they can be successful mm-hmm. in our society and that uh, the opportunities are there. And if they're not, they can create them and uh, just get people uh, engaged in building this state further. Governor, thank you so thank much. You, uh, thank you, my friend James. Thank you, Al. Appreciate thank you. it. All right, thank you, sir. Thank all you, right. James, for all you're doing. It made a huge difference. Thanks, thank you Governor. very much. Appreciate that. Thank you. That's it. Conversations with Al McFarland is brought to you by U.S. Bank. I 
just a cowboy, I'm gonna come into your town. Every time I see you, you make my heart go wild. Every time you kiss me, you make me want to smile. It's all right, it's okay. I want to be the special lover of the day. want to be your cowboy, please. 